at 10 years old, I had just left the colored school, going over to a school that you're different from everybody else was not easy. She said, we have a new student, her name is Anella, and she pointed to the back of the room and said, your seat is located in the back of the room. As a person of color, I also knew that I had to do the job five times better because if I didn't do well in that position, I would close the door for others behind me. You have been nominated as the person to become the next city president. I told him, absolutely not. Because I knew there were five men that were politicking for that position. He always would tell us, if you don't, who will? It's really short. It's short, so enjoy life. And Nella Matoyer came from humble beginnings. Starting in a colored school, Anella didn't quite fit in due to the color of her skin. Yet when she transitioned to a white or integrated school, she didn't quite fit in there either. She faced daily challenges, yet remained ever curious, determined, and driven. She rose through the ranks of the banking industry to become the city president of one of today's major banks. Her inspiring story is found in her number one best-selling book, Dare to be the Change. Anella has a unique perspective on leadership, race, diversity, and what it takes to be successful. She says that every challenge carries within it the seeds of an advantage. She has devoted her life to sharing her story of adversity, of hope, and tackling the fear that often grips us. As a veteran of the business trenches, she has a ton of life-changing insights to share. Don't miss this incredible interview where we cover leadership, coaching, communication, motivation, influence, and confidence. Welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. You have an incredibly interesting life full of achievement, full of firsts, full of overcoming. You have such a great story. You've written a book called Dare to be the Change and even a children's book as well. Why did you write Dare to be the Change? Mark, I I wrote Dare to be the Change because I wanted to share my experiences in the corporate world as a minority, Hmm. both as a woman and a person of color. And so many individuals that I had worked with in the past encouraged me to do so because not very many individuals are free to just tell your story. So I sucked it up and said, okay, I'm going to share. You also wrote a children's book, Stronger Than Fear. What was the motivation behind that? The motivation behind Stronger Than Fear comes from my grandson. One day he came over to visit us and he started telling me a story of a young man that was bullying him because he has curly hair like his grandmother. So we had a conversation about that and I shared with him that I'd like to have some more conversation the next time he came over. So I wrote a a quick draft about a little boy that was struggling with a bully. And when he came over, I brought him in my office and I said, read this and see what you think. So he read the first couple of paragraphs and he said, Nana, that's me. And I said, yeah, it's your story. And I would like your permission to put it into a children's book. And he said, Nana, The one thing I would ask that for you to do is to make it a little bit stronger in the sense of putting a dog in it with me. So could you change it up just a little so that the kids won't know it's really me? And I got to tell you, Mark, when the book was published, the following Christmas, we gave a book to each one of the grandkids in the family but I had him read the book with me to all the kids sitting in a circle. And just that small space 
watching him read that story, because it's, it's his story, to the children gave him strength. So now when he talks about bullying, he refers back to the book of Stronger Than Fear. And he will always tell smaller kids that starts bullying, he'll tell them, that's not nice, you're bullying. And that's not the way to be a good person. So in the journey of that particular book, it's made him a better person And he's also sharing his story to help others become kinder in this world. So I want to get into your story. Take me back to when you were a child. Tell me about 10-year-old Anella. What was she like? 10-year-old Anella. I was probably the most curious person around. I asked so many questions. I wanted to know so much about everything. But also at 10 years old, I had just left the colored school and that's what we called it back in the day and moved over to an integrated school system, the white school. So everything was of interest to me. I was asking probably a lot more questions than I should and stayed in trouble all the time. Tell me about your experience making that transition from a colored school to a white school. It was hard, Mark. It was not easy because going over to a school that you're different from everybody else was not easy. I remember the first day that I walked in, my mom took me to school I was in the fifth grade and the school teacher met us at the door. She introduced me and said, we have a new student. Her name is Anella. And she pointed to the back of the room and said, your seat is located in the back of the room. So as a child, the room looked huge and the steps to get to that desk took, seemed like forever. I turned around to look for my mom who my mom was being ushered away by the principal. And then from the back of the room, this young man yells and he says, look at here, we didn't get a black nigger, we got a pink nigger. And that is how my journey started in an integrated school system. Tell me about some of the most memorable moments or adversities that you had to overcome because you're fairly fair actually so tell me a little bit about what it was like to be a fair-skinned person of color integrating into all of that and what were some of the challenges and adversities that you had to face and overcome when i think about that i think about the space of just not fitting in different activities for example i was selected as a cheerleader had a lot of energy, wanted to do as much as I could to prove myself that I could be as good as another cheerleader. However, the families of the small town that I grew up in would not allow people of color to go over to their homes. We made different decorations for football games, posters and different things. Anella had to make those herself because she was not allowed to go over to the teens' homes in order to make those particular posters or decorations. So it was always something a little different for us growing up as a person of color. In your book, you talk about how you turned adversity into your advantage. How did you do that? So you mentioned that I am a lighter color in skin color. And when you are in that space, you have the opportunity to sit in rooms that others may not be invited into. So that became an advantage. However, when you sit in a room that the room may not know who you are, that you're a person of color. Many individuals are quite free 
to say whatever they may be thinking. And when that happens, I always felt it was my responsibility to raise my hand and help that person see another point of view. And then ultimately working with that individual so that the next time that there's a meeting or a, a function, that individual would not view people as a whole just because of the color of their skin. With so much adversity that you faced, it would have been easy and even justifiable for you to become angry and bitter, and many have. Yet you turned out to be the exact opposite. What would you attribute that to? Part of it is faith. And the other part of it is just my own internal drive to help people see another side. Every time that I hear someone say something in a negative fashion, it's like my head goes into automatic drive that I've got to help them see another side of the topic, right or wrong, just let's look at another side of that topic because it doesn't mean that I'm right, but maybe there's another way to look at it. Do you think that we have evolved as a society or do you think that we have a better veneer for racism in our country today? That's a very interesting question, Mark, because I ponder that constantly. In fact, I just had a conversation with a good friend of mine about this. And here is how our conversation went. I have worked 40 years in the financial industry and my whole career was centered around opening doors for others. And I really felt that I made a difference in that arena. However, in the last four years, I have seen that whole structure just totally disappear. And what I'm also seeing that it's affecting families and it should not come all the way down to families. It was always that the family structure was strong enough to withstand what was happening. But in the last four years, I have seen families have been destroyed by this. No, we're not in a good space. However, I still have the faith and the internal drive to continue to help people see another side. In your career, you ascended to become the city president for a major bank in this country. Tell me about your path to get there. So I started in banking back in the 70s. My first job was stamping addresses on envelopes. Back in the day, we mailed canceled checks to the customers. So window envelopes were not something that we utilized. And it was every day taking a little manual machine, putting in the address and stamping the address on an envelope. Did that eight hours a day, five days a week. From that, I made a decision that I was going to learn every department in banking because I was not going to continue to stamp addresses on envelopes. So whenever a position came open, I applied for the position. Now I've got to tell you, some of the positions that I applied for, oh goodness, I would think, why did I do this to myself? This is the most boring work I've ever done. However, in the back of my head, I kept saying, if you get the next position, you'll understand banking even more. So I worked in all the departments from bookkeeping to loans, and I continued to tap individuals to mentor me through that journey. But as a person of color, I also knew that I had to do the job five times better because if I didn't do well in that position, I would close the door for others behind me. So the burden was always there. 
take the position, but you got to do it five times better than the other person because you cannot close that door for others to follow you. So with that mindset, I was fortunate enough to continue to be promoted. And then ultimately became city president of a bank. What do you feel that you did better than anyone else that made everyone around you feel like you were the person to lead the organization? Most people that knew me always said that I came into any organization with a brand. Hmm. And that brand was trustworthy, fair, hard worker. And I, when I think back about that, when you ask that question, I, I'm going back to the young Anella. And I've had so many great mentors. And I have one that today is still my mentor. And some of the lessons that he shared with me really helped me determine who did I want to be in the banking industry. Once I determined who I wanted to be, I was not going to step off of that brand. I was going to continue to show that I was the person that was fair. I was a hard worker. I was trustworthy. And I just had that particular brand and stayed in that space of my brand. Today, I do that with my clients. I always ask them, who are you? What do you stand for? And why are you there in that particular company? Because I want them to understand when someone looks at you and gets to know you, do they understand who you are? Because you do not want to be that individual that one day they see she's fair, but then the next day they see this person's not trustworthy. Determine who your brand is and stay there. Do not make excuses. Don't, if someone comes up to you and say, Anella, and people would come up to me and say, Anella, you spend too many hours at the job. You work too hard. That was part of my brand and I was not going to give it up. It sounds like there was a real intentionality about your identity that you were bringing forward. Was becoming the president part of that brand or was it a not, result of your brand? It was not in my journey at all. The position that I was in was the top of the level and that's all I ever wanted to do. In fact, when my boss called me and said, Anella, we're going to do a revamp of all positions at the executive level and that you have been nominated as the person to become the next city president. I told him, absolutely not. Because I knew there were five men that were politicking for that position. And I knew that if I got that position, I was not going to be supported. It took me a, a couple of weeks to finally say yes. And it was in the encouragement of my father. And today he's 89 years old and good health. And I just love talking to my father because he has so much wisdom. He always would tell us, if you don't, who will? And when he tells you that, it just, it's like the space of we were placed on this earth to do something. So if you don't, then who will do it? So when I had the conversation with him, of course, that's what he said. If you don't, who will? What kind of complex challenges were you solving at the level of a city president? Banking is highly regulated. And the greatest challenge in banking that you always have is ensuring that everyone stays within the regs. And so you spend a lot of time doing that. But I had an ability of bringing people together to work for a common cause. And that is probably where my greatest strength was, is bringing people together. Whether it was working on projects for a nonprofit organization or just doing good for others 
within the company or within the community. So you mentioned earlier that when you took the position of city president, that there were several men who were already politicking for that position. Now, assuming that they were still in their positions, I would imagine that you had some work to do to turn them around to get them on your side, right? Yes. How did you do that? It took the support of a number of individuals within the organization that truly supported me. So for example, there was one young man that called me up and congratulated me that I had been promoted and indicated that he would support me. And I I was pleased to hear that, but I, I knew that I was still faced with some challenges. My boss decided that we needed to bring everybody in the same room so that they would hear the same message. I requested that we hire an outside vendor to come into the room so that it would not be anything biased. The meeting started out really good, had a lot of great conversation of working together and looking at the challenges and what we would face and what we needed to do in the next year, two years, et cetera. And then there was a conversation by several that became quite negative. And the gentleman that had called me earlier that said that would support, he would support me stood up and said, I understand that you may not agree with what the decision was, but I'm here to say that I am gonna support Anella because Anella is a hard worker, she's trustworthy, she's fair, And I want to see what's going to happen under her leadership. And from that one statement, you saw others stand up in the room, just stand up, supporting and clapping, saying that, yes, I'm here to support her. So the majority of the room stood and and said they would support me. And it started from there. Now, the individuals that did not support me, I worked with them one-on-one, ensured that they had the level of visibility that they did not feel that someone had placed them on the side. So it's bringing people together for a common cause that makes people feel like they're part of a solution. It's very wise. What were some of the greatest lessons that you learned along the way in 40 years in the banking business? The greatest lesson is you got to take care of yourself. And I will tell you that I didn't do a very good job of doing so. True, I would walk the treadmills in the hotel, walk around the hotel, because I traveled quite a bit. However, didn't eat well because I would eat nine o'clock at night. Just all those things that you do when you're young and you think you're invincible. However, when you get to my age today, things start breaking down. And as, I, as much as I tell the younger generation today, please take care of yourself until you experience it yourself that something happens medical wise, you don't realize that all of that that you did back when you were young catches up with you. So it caught up with me. And the last couple of years, I've had uh, some medical issues that I've been working through. So my greatest lesson today is take care of yourself because life is really short. You're just here for a visit. So you're a coach now and a person comes to you with their own adversity or their own problem. Based on your experience, how would you advise them through it? What's your process for advising them through that? That problem? I enjoy coaching so much because it is a partnership with another person. It's really listening and understanding where the person is in the situation and then helping them see a different perspective and eventually a solution that they will uncover for themselves. It's really 
taking the time to hear the person. A lot of times when something in an adversity issue is going on, you have your own biases and you're not really hearing what the person is saying. That's why coaching, when I talk to individuals and they're struggling with that, I always ask, so do you have a mentor or a coach that you can have some conversations with so that they can help you see something different and then ultimately find your solution? So a lot of it is about helping them to find their own solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I will tell you, Mark, people have it within themselves. They do. And when you're coaching someone, you will pull that out of them. And then ultimately, they will stand on their strengths and no longer see themselves in the space of just having opportunities. It's about really focusing on their strengths. In one of your talks, you discuss becoming the voice in the room. Where did that talk come from? And how does a person build the confidence to do that? That topic is really from, a, from my life in the financial world. Sitting in a room of executives of 35 individuals, and as in any meeting, there is a voice that's there that everyone's listening to, whether it's a facilitator or several voices that are in the room. The voice becomes very powerful when individuals seek that person out. One day I was sitting in the room and there was a conversation that was going on about an individual that was going to be promoted. And so everyone was giving their input. When this particular person spoke, everyone listened. There were other individuals speaking However, they were saying the same thing this person was saying, but no one was listening to all, everyone else, which, you know, I sat back in my chair and said, why is this person being listened to? And everyone else is saying the same thing, but no one's listening because this person is the voice in the room. So how could Anella become that voice in the room so that when she speaks, that individuals will listen. And I knew that wasn't going to happen overnight. You've got to have the confidence to understand, I mean, just to speak up, to understand how to be heard in the room. One of the gifts that I definitely had was about 30 years ago, I was introduced to behaviors, understanding different behaviors, whether the person was analytical or the person was dominant what type of behavior was being heard? Most of the time, the behavior was dominant. And because I'm very analytical, I got to process things. I got to sit back. I got to listen. I got to understand before I'm going to speak up. I had to really think through how am I going to change my approach when I walked into the room to become that voice. A coach of mine, that I had a conversation with, said to me one day, which was changing for me, said to me, how will you show up for this meeting? And of course, I'm thinking, how will I show up for this meeting? I'm going to show up. She said, no, think about that. No, how will you show up in the room? How will you be that voice? When you walk in the room, how do you show up? The next meeting, when I walked in the room, I took note of what I normally did. What I normally did as an analytical individual, walk in the room, put my work down, sit down, take out my paper and pen so I'm ready to take notes, get my coffee, my water, whatever, and I'm prepared. I'm totally over-prepared. Looked around the room, that's not what everybody else was doing. Everybody else was socializing, high-fiving, talking with individuals. That's not what Enola did. So I had to change my behavior so that I could become a voice in the room. And I will tell you that from that one conversation with my coach, 
I took note of who was the facilitator. If the facilitator was dominant, I had to be very direct, get to the point when I was communicating. If the person was analytical, I made sure I had lots of detail. If that person was in that steady relationship behavior, I always had a great conversation with them before the meeting to understand how their family was doing. It was just changing and understanding how the room was so that I would be heard. That was probably the greatest gift my coach gave me by asking that one question, how will you show up? So how does a person discover their strengths to become that voice in the room? Great question. Who better to know your strengths than yourself? Earlier, I mentioned to you that when I start working with a client, I ask them, answer these questions for yourself. Who am I? What do I stand for? And why am I here? I always start with that to understand how they see themselves. True, I will do a survey to understand how others perceive them ask some simple questions. What are they doing? What could they improve? Something really simple so that I can understand not only how they see themselves, but then how others perceive them. Once I get all of that information, then we have some conversation about understanding how others perceive them and their strengths, how they see their strengths, and then start working around establishing, so what is your brand? And really focusing on those particular strengths. I'll give you an example. I coached an attorney once that told me, and now all I like doing is research. I don't want to go in a courtroom. I don't want to do, and she went through quite a number of things of the things she didn't want to do. But what she really loved doing was research. Research is definitely a strength of hers because it's what she makes her feel full, makes her feel that she's giving back in that conversation. Then we place that on the strengths. Now, I will tell you that when someone talks about their strengths to me, we also conquer their opportunities as well, because I'm not going to leave those on the side. I have a client right now that is working on the space of not being analytical. And the job requires this person to be analytical. They have a lot of other strengths, but the analytics is what's needed in the position. So we're talking about, so how do you strengthen that opportunity so that it does not give you the sense of being a failure, because that's not what we want you to be. We want you to really hone in on your strengths. One of the questions that I asked this individual, I asked her, now what your strengths are, how are you communicating that? How am I communicating that? What do you mean by that? I said, so how how are you telling your supervisor? How are you telling the folks that you work with, that's your strengths. So that the next project that comes around that could lead to you getting a promotion, are you telling them what your strengths are? Never had that opportunity, Anella. You haven't. So you do not get a performance evaluation every six months, once a year, at a minimal once a year having that conversation so that they understand your strengths because it's, again, building on your brand so they know who you are. So those are the conversations that I have to help people understand what is your strengths and let's really focus on that. I will also tell you that I've had clients that discover their strengths and then find out they're in the total wrong job. And then it's the conversation of, do you really want to continue to stay in that space or do you want to maybe look for something else that you can utilize your strength? A lot of your work requires you to take someone from one level and take them to the next. If you were to take someone, say, who was an individual contributor or a manager, for example, how do you take that person 
and develop them into a leader, someone who could take on broader, greater responsibilities. How have you done that in the past? Interesting that so many individuals do not see themselves as a leader. And it's society has placed this leadership space in, it depends on your title. Unless you have a title, then you're not a leader. It's the first conversation of understanding that everybody's a leader and all individuals are, are leaders. So it's spending again the time identifying the strengths and then just solidifying these strengths. Still comes back to your brand and helping them see, so what are you good at? When I look at myself, I knew my behavior was very analytical. And in the financial world, you got to be analytical. So to sit down and look at a report, that's fine for me. But my other side of my behavior is dominant. So I knew it was a strength, but it also could be perceived in a negative way. So one of the things that I worked with my coach for the good two years is understanding how I was communicating so that I was not communicating in a dominant fashion. And that took a long time to really uncover that and then work on that. Because again, if you don't know how people perceive you, then that's a blind spot. And then ultimately, it will not help you in your journey of growth in your company. In one of your talks, you talk about a concept called forward feeding. What is that? It's a, a forward feed is a different way of looking at feedback. You can't change what happened in the past. So think about it, Mark. The norm is you ask permission to give feedback. That happened way back here. I always give feed forward. Let's look into the future. Here is the feed that's a forward thinking. In the conversation, I always ask for permission. Do I have your permission to give you some forward feed? And it's just looking into the future because it can't really change what happened in your conversation in your past. So can you give me an example of what that might look like? I'll, I'll give you an example of what I always did when, when I gave a presentation or anything, and I still do it today. After I do a presentation, I will find somebody in the audience and I will go up to them and I will say, could you give me some insight into how well I did and one opportunity of how I can improve? And so that person will always tell you how great you did, but I will not let that person off until they give me one opportunity of how I can improve in the future. That's a very powerful way of asking that question because you're inviting the feedback essentially. I normally have to explain, I'm not asking back here what the feedback was, what happened over here. What I'm looking for is some forward information so that I can ensure that in the future that I don't repeat something that maybe you saw. It's always interesting to have that conversation with someone because they just want to be nice to you. Oh, I want to be so nice to you. Do I have to tell you anything? Yes, you do. I ask my clients as well, tell me what I do well, but also give me some insight of what you would like to see me improve upon. Over the course of your career, you've worked with many teams at every level. How do you build or create a high performance team from the C-suite to the board of directors to the line? How do you build that high performance team? When I worked with teams, individuals that had some strengths that they may not have seen within themselves, those were usually the people that I would tap on the shoulder. I always focused on their particular strength, and then had some conversation around how we can build upon that. 
again, it's taking that person and helping them reinforce that particular strength so they can become an asset for the team as well as the company. I'll give you an example. I worked with a young man once that unfortunately he was not going to be promoted because unfortunately in the environment that I was working at the time, his skin color was not going to help him get promoted. However, he was brilliant and no one could see the strengths that he had. I called him in my office one day and asked him, where do you see yourself in the next year, five years? I wanted to understand where did he see himself? And he shared with me that all he wanted to do was take care of his family. He was not looking for a position of authority or any, anything other than a good salary, take care of his family. I started sharing with him some of the strengths that I saw in his presentations, when we were in meetings, when he worked with others, how he had so much patience and he was always willing to cross train someone. And I shared with him that I could see him leading a a department that he would be amazing because his people skills were just absolutely amazing. We continued to have conversation and it was, I could see that I was building confidence in him because he didn't see it in himself. And I don't know if it's family or people he had worked with in the past that never took the time to have that conversation with him. As we continued to have those conversations, one day there was an opening for a supervisor position. And I called him up and I said, you're ready. You're going to apply for this. And I, I, you're perfect for this. And of course, you really think so? Do you think I should? Absolutely. So my norm was if I asked someone to apply for a job, I then took the time to go talk to the supervisor, talk to people that I knew would be in the room that would be making the decision to help them understand the qualities that a person had. When this gentleman got the job, I could still see his face because months before, never thought that he would even be considered for the position. From that, continuing encouragement and then ultimately continue to be promoted. Today, this person is still at a high level position. Of course, I feel like a proud mom because I know the conversations we had back in the day that put him on that path to continue to be promoted. And I got to tell you, when you leave an industry as banking was the love of my life and individuals reach back out to you and say, hey, Anella, you remember when I was a teller and you, you had a hard conversation with me? I hated every moment of that conversation with you. Do you want to know what I'm doing today? I am now running a call center with 500 employees. And of course, I love hearing those stories. And it's always great when someone finds you on LinkedIn and then reaches out and shares a story like that, because it said you made a difference. You did inspire. You did develop Anella. Does that change at the higher levels of management, like at the C-suite level or at the board level? I would say it's the same. It's that process of just building confidence. So I want to talk about one of the other talks that you give is what something that you call feminine fear. What is feminine fear? I always become interested in topics because of a conversation or something that I have with someone. And this came about because I was having a conversation with a young lady who was struggling in a male dominated job. And after our coaching session, I started interviewing some other women to understand, did they have fear in their male dominated 
position. And what I found was that fear was the number one issue over the 90% of the women that I interviewed. And it always showed up in either the first or the second conversation. And it was always the fear of losing a job, fear of not being promoted, fear of being promoted, and then the fear of failure in that promotion. So I just continued to have more conversations about how they were feeling. I even stopped people in the grocery store. If I ran into somebody I hadn't seen in a long time, I would say, I'm just trying to understand this thing about women having so much fear. And in one of the conversations, an individual said, and now have you read the, and this was back in 2017, the, a study that was done in the workplace indicated that women remain underrepresented in every level in corporate America, despite earning more college degrees than men for 30 years and counting. As a result of this, only one in five C-suite leaders is a woman, and fewer than one in 30 is a woman of color. So one of the factors that I also found is that women's lower rate of promotion is that women are less likely to receive advice from managers and senior leaders on how to advance in a company. And so now when I talk to women that I coach, I ask that question, are you reaching out to leaders that are above your head to understand what does it take to be advanced in your particular company? What's going to take for that next promotion? And I I know that, and I can even speak for myself, we're less likely to ask for a raise or promotion or any type of top management jobs. Here's how we look at it. We look at it as if I do a good job, they're going to notice it and I'll get to that next level. Whereas men, you'll go on the golf course or you'll do some type of function with a man and you'll have that conversation. Women just will not have that conversation. And a lot of it is because of fear of just rejection, because here I always call it that person that kind of sits on your shoulder and is talking in your ear. Oh, no, I can't ask that. I can't ask that. That's not for me to ask that. They should know that I'm doing a great job. No, you need to ask that question. What is it going to take for me to get that next promotion? What is it that I need to do to get a mentor? What is it going to take for me to become part of the emerging leadership program? Ask the question, because if you don't ask the question, they're not going to even know you're interested. In your view, what are the root causes of fear? The root cause, I will tell you, it's fear of failure. It's people just don't want to fail. And I'm not going to ask that because if they're going to say no, I always laugh at my sisters. I have three sisters. And if we're going to do something that has to do with the family, no, you ask, Canelo, because you're not afraid to ask. And I'm not afraid to ask, what's the worst that could happen? They're going to tell you, no, okay, ask a different way. In that same talk, you talk about power sources and levels of power. What are those concepts? Your power sources, it could be spiritual, it could be a coach, it could be a family member, your network, it could be helping others, it could be physical activity. It's tapping into something that gives you a foundation to overcome your fear. And my power source has always been my father. It's just, he has always been there for me. When I have this thing that's speaking in my ear that says, hey, no, no, you shouldn't do that. That's just not the right thing. I go to him and he will always give me a sense that, yes, Anella, if you don't, who will? And it's that foundation to overcome that fear of moving forward. So whatever your power source is, one of my sisters, her power source is definitely spiritual. And I got to tell you, I admire her because she is really strong in that space. That's her power source. So everyone has a power source, but do you really tap into it? 
What about levels of power? There's actually three levels of power. You have power, but you might be losing it or you might be misusing it. So when you think about people that you encounter, they have a lot of power, but they might be misusing it. And so that's not a, a good view. Mm -hmm. Or you have no power because you're completely powerless or the power is available to you, but maybe you haven't claimed it because of why? Fear, because you just have not claimed it. How do we become a power source for others? Mark, I'm certain that you're a power source to others. If just what you're doing today and uh, from the interviews you've done. But a great example of a power source is just being a coach or a mentor, just helping someone to overcome something that may be caused because of fear. I want to ask just some more general questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? Living my brand, inspire people and develop people. If you're going to do anything, determine what your brand is and live it. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? You can't be everything to everyone. Just be you. And what is the greatest lesson that you've learned either in life or in business? always give back. We receive so many blessings daily, even though we discount some of the blessings that we receive. Woke up this morning, it's a blessing. Absolutely. So when you think about that, work with a nonprofit. I am a big advocate of nonprofit. One of the ones that I work with is the Women's Resource, where we provide financial literacy for women we teach classes to help women. And imagine today after a pandemic, how much that is needed because so many people are hurting. Give back something that, some of the blessings that you re received. Absolutely. And what you're doing in, in the financial education space is really admirable because it's needed in normal times, let alone pandemic times. What do you want most for your life? I just want to enjoy life because when you get older, you realize it's really short. It's short. So enjoy life. I've asked you a lot of questions. So are there, I want to open the floor to you. Are there any other final thoughts that you want to share with us? I'd like to share that I've got a new book that's going to be coming out this year. It's called Now What? Managing a Southern Transition in Your Career. It's stories that others have shared when they were on a journey in their career and they thought nothing's going to happen. And then one day somebody walks in and says, it's over with. We're going to have a, a reduction in force. I took all of those stories and put them together in a book. And it's really something that I wanted to share with the world to help people understand that you can overcome a change like that and move forward. Look at me. I, I have moved forward from a 40-year career. I'm a coach. I'm a speaker. I'm a writer. I have done a number of things that I've moved on and enjoying life. It's fantastic. I'll, your story is amazing. You are amazing. And people really need to get to know you, Anella. And I'm so honored that you took time to be with me today. Folks, her books are Dare to Be the Change, Stronger Than Fear. Her website is anellamatoyer.com. Please find her, reach out to her, get to know her as I have. Your life and your career will not be the same. Anella, thank you so much for spending the time with me and for sharing all that you shared with us today. Mark, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the subscribe button to get the latest content and check out these other great clips from the podcast.